Portugal. All right. Everyone's on notice. <laughs> Excellent. Very good. Do we have any volunteers to open us in prayer? Thank you, Sherry. Let's pray. God of the whole world, we are thankful to be here tonight. We are thankful to have um, our curiosity um, peaked and to learn and to grow and to see how this world of wonder is connected. Um, <clears throat> please make our, our minds and hearts open to receiving whatever, um, whatever Drew has to give to us this evening. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> All right, let's see if we can get the technology to work. So we have a saying in the space of faith and science that whenever you get technology involved in a faith and science event, it stops working. <laughs> it's almost inevitable. Um, well, my, now what's happening? Huh? Yeah, we're doing all sorts of interesting things. Oh, wow. that, I've never seen that one before. It's a mirror. Oh, that was a little snake. snake. <laughs> Snail. All Am right. I blocking Let's you? see yeah. how long it takes to share up there. There we go. So I'm going to wing this without my notes. So you're not going to get a lot of the detailed data because I use mostly images in the PowerPoint, but I'll do the best I can from memory. And I can look back later and, and unshare my screen when the time comes. Um, I'll say a little bit more about science for the church uh, at the end. We're a relatively new ministry, and one way to think of our work is we're trying to put science and scripture in conversation in ways that benefit the church, um, in a nutshell. And so there's a, you know, as many topics as you can think of in science and in the life of the church and theology and scripture, those are all things we're interested in. We, we cover a lot of terrain. Most of what I do is very much at a generalist level. We work with scientists and theologians and others who are experts, but a lot of what I'm going to do here is summarize what the experts have done. And the topic we came up with was this connection of faith and healing. And so putting medical science in particular in conversation with scripture. Uh, and so that's what I want to do today. And I want to ask a question about your congregation here. Is what you do at Westminster Presbyterian Church good for you? Does it benefit your health in any way? Yes. That's essentially the question I want to ask, and I'm going to start with Scripture. You probably know both of these stories that I'm going to share. The first one uh, from Mark 5, it's repeated in different forms in, in other Gospels, is the woman who had been hemorrhaging for 12 years. And she approaches Jesus, she touches his cloak, and she's immediately healed. And there's a little bit of a, a fuss, who did that? What happened? And she kind of, it was me, Jesus. And he ends it with this saying, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Uh, so that phrase, your faith has made you well, Jesus uses it repeatedly. He also uses it with blind Bartimaeus and in stories of healing other blind individuals uh, in the Gospels with blind Bartimaeus, a little different story. It's more of an interaction between them. And then Jesus at the end says, go, your faith has made you well. So there's not a, a physical touching like there was with the woman in the cloak. And again, Jesus says those words immediately. Blind Bartimaeus regains his sight and he follows Jesus on the way. And so we've got in scripture, it seems pretty clear there's some connection between faith and healing. It happens all the time in Jesus's ministry. Um, and so I want to ask, does our faith make us well? What does medical science have to say here? Are, in the language we like to use at Science for the Church, are God's two books, the book of scripture and the book of nature, are they in agreement uh, on this topic? Uh, and that's what I want to investigate with you tonight. I want to begin with an important caveat. Um, we, we need to think a little bit about what healing is. And so healing is something our bodies do very, very naturally all the time. Think of all the scratches and uh, sore throats and headaches and bruises. Think of all the things you have 
that just heal on their own all the time. Our bodies are fearfully and wonderfully made and they're really, really good at healing. That is probably the primary way we all heal. Now, of course, we all know we get ailments, injuries, things that don't just heal on their own. And that's where modern medicine comes in. Uh, and traditional medicines, there, there, there are forms certainly that precede that, but particularly today in the United States, we rely on modern Western medicine. But that's not the only way that we can heal. I believe very, very strongly that God can heal us directly as well. Um, if we, and if we lived in Africa or South America or other parts of the world, there would be accounts almost daily of God healing people. And I don't think there's anything in science. I don't think there's any reason not to believe that God can't do that. And I also think it's important to believe that maybe the way God heals us here in the West isn't by me laying hands on you or praying for you, but by you going to the doctor and God working through the doctor and whatever therapy the doctor. God can work through all of those mechanisms, through the, our natural ability to heal, through something like prayer or touch or holy water or through Western medical science. Those are all ways that God can heal. And I don't want to have any opposition between any of them. I don't see any reason for it. So that's the first caveat I want to offer. The second one I want to offer is this connection between the mind and the body. This could be a whole nother talk. It would get very philosophical, but what, you know, are there two substances or are we one? Is there a soul? Is there not? What is consciousness? Huge, wonderful topic. Another place we could go. For the sake of our conversation here, what I just want to make very, very clear is there is a connection between our bodies, our physical selves, and our minds, and whatever it is that's spiritual in us. These things are interconnected in very deep and important ways. And it's, it's important for, for pretty much everything I'm going to say the rest of the time here. How do I'm we know sure that? Oh, sorry, my watch is <laughs> I'll try to help you understand it, but your watch doesn't get it. So uh, for me, the, the best example of this is Marita knows this. I've got three daughters. One of them is still young. We still have ouchies quite a bit in the house. And think of a little child when they scratch their knee. The tears, the emotion, the mental distress that accompanies it. And then miraculously, a Band-Aid can make all of that emotional stress go away. Just like that. There's a clear connection between the mind and the body. And it goes the other way around. If we are stressed at work or worried about the, the health or the well-being of a parent or whatever the situation, our own health, that will have long-term impact on our own physical health. And that happens through these chemicals that go through our brain. Things like cortisol that help us navigate stress. They're really good for us in short doses. So if there is a bear in the woods there that's about to jump through the window. We all want cortisol to course through our brains really quickly so that we know whether to fight or flight and how to react to that. But if that cortisol is running through our brains for long periods of time, that's really bad for us. That's where long-term heart disease and many, many other things come. The, the, those stress hormones are really good in short doses, but long-term anxiety and stress, those things are bad for us. And they have huge detrimental effects on, on our physical well-being uh, long-term. One last link kind of mind and body. How many folks have heard of the placebo effect? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, and you've probably read some of the stories about it. It is remarkable what a sugar pill can do. Mm -hmm. um, you just take it and if you think it's medicine, wow, you can be healed just like that. Again, the power, the connection between the mind and the body, it's, it's pretty significant. Um, and it's, I think it's really important as we think about faith and healing. All right, what does the medical research say? We're gonna give it a go here and I'm gonna to try to do this without my data points on my notes <laughs> and let's see if we can get the video to work in here. So I wanna start with a summary that the Mayo Clinic has produced. This is, I think this is six or eight years old if I remember correctly, but they're taking 
thousands and thousands and thousands of studies that are looking at the interface of religion and health. Um, from many, many disciplines, some are very narrowly looking at cancer or addiction or heart surgery or a whole host of things. Um, and interestingly, I don't know how many ties this congregation has to Duke. A lot of that research was done by individuals at Duke. Duke is one of the main hubs for that type of research. Uh, and so the Mayo Clinic summarizes it as you can read on the screen. It says religious involvement and spirituality are associated with better health outcomes. They find that evidence compelling enough across all of these studies to say, yes, our faith makes us well. And then it gets more specific. It's things like longevity. You live longer, coping skills, and other health-related quality of life. Um, so things like someone diagnosed with terminal illness tends to fare better. They don't necessarily survive, but they tend to fare better and often live a little bit longer than someone else who is not deeply religious or spiritual. And then there are this, <clears throat> this other list that, that is consistent across almost every study I'm gonna mention, less anxiety, lower depression, and lower levels of suicide are, are things that seem to come with religious involvement and spirituality. Uh, and then there's another line of research that has also suggested that spirituality, and this is a little less kind of consensus, can actually help in recovery from an illness. So quicker recovery from a surgery or a procedure or a disease. Um, so those are, again, thousands of studies, lots of debates. There's atheist medical researchers that don't like this research. There's Christian medical researchers that think every study is convincing and accurate. And then there's people in the middle, like the Mayo Clinic, that are trying to sort through all of that and say, which, which ones can we state with some confidence are probably true? Uh, and so I, that's why I wanted to share this summary with you. So the, the one that's probably gotten the most traction and seems to have the most studies suggesting it's true is that longevity piece. People who attend religious services, it's not specific to any one tradition, but they who attend regularly tend to live longer in a variety of studies than people that are not involved in a religious community. There seems to be a pretty clear connection there. And now we have the challenge to see if I can get the video to play. Um, Dr. Marino Bruce at Vanderbilt has led one of these studies. Uh, and he's really interesting because he's a medical researcher, but he's also clergy. He's also a pastor. Uh, and so we'll see if we can get this to play in a form where everybody can follow along and listen without any technical glitches. <laughs> We found in our study that actually attending church is actually good for your health, particularly for those who are between the ages of 40 and 65. Any place of worship, any place where groups gather together to worship, it could be a church, it could be a temple, it could be a mosque. So it's, it's not only about a particular faith, it's about any faith. Middle-aged adults who attended church actually reduced their risk for mortality by 55%. For those who did not attend, attend church at all, they were twice as likely to die prematurely than those who did, who attended church at some point over the last year. We had over 5,000 people in this study, and we uh, collected data on their church attendance. We looked at their socioeconomic status. We looked at their, whether or not they had health insurance, how they looked at their health, health, and we took all of that into consideration, and we estimated a statistical model that actually predicts their risk for mortality. I'm ordained clergy, so I'm always uh, thinking about what do we mean by spiritual health? Does spiritual health matter uh, with respect to biological outcomes? And so we've, we have a study looking at a large sample of adults between 40 and 65, and we found that, you know what, by uh, being in a place where you can flex those spiritual muscles, actually are beneficial for your health. Other studies have looked at, have uh, presumed that social support was a big part of that. We actually took that into consideration. So while churches are places where people can get social support, we actually found that and began to think about whether um, compassion 
is particularly important. So feeling that you're doing good or, or, or having empathy for others. The other piece that we, that we are thinking that we'd like to pursue in future studies is this idea of holiness, and that's being a part of something that's greater than oneself. Uh, we think those two things operate in most religions, not, not one in particular, and those two factors uh, create a sense of self that, uh, that will lead to uh, eating healthier, that will, uh, you feel better about yourself, therefore you're gonna take better care of yourself. The best thing about this is sometimes in health science we tend to look at, at those things that are always negative and say, don't do this, don't do that, don't eat this. This is encouraging, encouraging individuals to participate in something. We thought that social support would actually be a larger effect than church attendance. And what we found that even in those models where we considered social support, church attendance still mattered. So that was, that was quite significant because most assume that people go to church for the social support. Actually, they go to, we found that they go to church for factors beyond social support. And that's where we begin to think about this idea of holiness, this idea of compassion. Thinking about that we are participating in trying to improve the lives of others as well as being connected to a body larger than ourselves. slide to go with this was one of the places where we had some issues before there we go i don't know if there's a way to check could the people online hear and follow that video okay we can we can send yeah. you a link to it good yeah, good because uh, the most important thing was being able to hear not not necessarily being able to see so this is the the, the key article that dr bruce published um like the whole second half of that video he would probably have medical peers that might question, is it social support? Is it more than that? More research probably needs to be done. But what's pretty um, accepted now is the overall longevity. Um, there was a study the year prior to this that was uh, in the journal for the American Medical Association. I forget where the researchers were. This, these are things that are in my notes that I can't access right now. That one was thousands of women and I want to, my memory is that it's about 15 years and it was like 30 or 40 percent stronger mortality for people that attended services regularly. And there were studies that preceded that, that both of these built upon. Um, and so there just, there seems to be this consensus that what we do when we gather contributes significantly to our health such that we tend to live longer. Um, so that's at the end of life. Let's talk a little bit about childhood, teenage years. There's been some research done here uh, out of Harvard, and they're looking at kind of the three big dangers of adolescence, depression, substance abuse, and risky behavior, which is often sexual behavior. Um, and they looked at kind of spirituality in children that were raised in religious homes and said, does that make any difference? And I'll blow up the results here to make it a little easier to see. So regular attendees of, of religious services, 12% less likely to be depressed, 33% less likely to use drugs. Um, when they pray and meditate frequently, 30% less likely to start having sex at a young age, 40% less likely to get a, a sexually transmitted disease. And then they went on the more positive side. So those that attend religious services, they're 18% more likely to report happiness, 87% more likely to uh, report high levels of forgiveness. And then those that meditate and pray regularly, they're more likely to volunteer and they're much more likely to have a sense of purpose. And if you know the research in positive psychology about things like generosity, volunteering, a sense of purpose, those things all have a whole host of benefits for us. Um, they, they help us significantly when we are giving and helping and in community and have a sense of purpose and meaning when we're optimistic, um, all of those things. I'll say more about that uh, in a moment. So the other end of life, there appear to be these benefits that will have positive health outcomes um, for our children that are engaged in the life uh, of our communities. 
What about the practices and some of the things we do? There's been a lot of research. Most of it's been done on prayer. Um, and prayer is a really, really tricky area because there's no kind of set methods for how we study prayer. And again, the difference between a believer doing a prayer study and a non-believer doing a prayer study, you can have pretty starkly different results. Uh, and I, I don't know if that's research design or interpretation of data. I, I don't know exactly what's going on there. What I think can be safe to say is intercessory prayer, the research done on that, it's really hard to draw any conclusions from it. Um, some of the supposedly most rigorous studies actually have shown no benefit whatsoever. Others have shown a benefit. It's, it's really murky. I would be reluctant to say anything definitive about intercessory prayer. Where there seems to be really strong evidence of benefit is things like meditation and contemplative prayer. And the benefits of prayer seem to be less on who you're praying for and more on the one doing the praying. And so it's a lot of things like lower levels of anxiety. Um, I think there's connections to memory loss. This is where I wish I had my notes in front of me. There, there's a string of them. The, uh, improved in attention is, is one. But a lot of it is, I think, depression and anxiety. We, we calm ourselves in that. And so those stress chemicals and other things, we turn them off. We, we, we turn them down um, through that type of, of practice. Um, so prayer seems to have some benefits, although they might not be the ones that you think they are. They're not necessarily connected to intercessory prayer. I didn't go into great detail. There's a bunch of fascinating work being done on religious rituals. Singing together appears to benefit us. Praying together. Um, taking part in certain types of rituals and there are certain patterns in how we do that that seem to have uh, benefits to us. Doing things uh, synchronously builds really good connection between people. Um, so there, there's a whole host of research there. Again, I don't think there's a lot that's been replicated enough to be definitive, but most of that research seems to show a benefit or a null effect. Very little of it shows it has a negative impact on us. Um, so the things we do through our baptism, through our prayers and community, through our liturgies, through our singing, may have some benefit to us as well. So what do we do with all this apparent good news that these things help us? Um, and uh, uh, there's been some provocative suggestions uh, that maybe medical doctors should start prescribing participation in your religious community. That when you go and you're struggling with whatever, what is your religious tradition? Where do you attend services? You should get more involved or you should stay involved. Um, and it, it was uh, kind of the highest level of it was done in a USA Today op-ed by one of the leading researchers in this area, Tyler Vanderweel at Harvard. He oversees the center that did the the youth adolescence research that I summarized. And I'll let you just take a minute to read it. He, he, he makes a pretty strong case here, um, uses uh, some, some good rhetoric here to try to convince us of why we should think about um, religion as a miracle drug and something doctors should prescribe. So now Tyler Vanderweel is a Christian, so he has a little bit of motivation in writing this. You, you probably wouldn't get a piece so strongly worded from one of the agnostic or atheists that work in this space, um, but it's I think it's something interesting to think about. It, it may be something we want to discuss at the end or that, that, that you would want to consider further is that like, would you be comfortable going into the doctor's office and the doctor saying, are you a person of faith? You, you know, maybe it's good for you to continue to stay connected to that or to get more involved. Um, it's, it's an interesting question. All right. When you're dealing with science, there's always nuance. So I want to share some of that nuance now. Religion isn't all good for us all the time. We've all, I don't think Westminster is one of them, but we've all read about toxic churches, right? Where abuse and other, those are not good for us. 
Um, likewise, there are certain theologies that we have sometimes collectively, most of the time individually. So if we believe God is the lawgiver who punishes and rewards, and God is punishing us when we're sick, that's probably not going to be very good for your health. That's going to bring on anxiety when you're ill rather than have some of the benefits we talked about. There are things like unforgiveness. Um, there's there's a really old video that I, I'd love to be able to show, but I haven't found a digital form of it, um, where a woman remembers a partner who abused her. And they've got her wired up to forget if it's blood pressure or heart rate or one of those monitors. And it's an older thing. And you just see the thing spike the minute the researcher asks her to remember that. You relive those situations all the time. And they're not good long term for your health. Um, so there are aspects that are not good for us. I think overwhelmingly what I said is, is all true, but we have to remember these caveats. And you certainly wouldn't want to encourage someone to go to a church where there's a history of trauma or abuse or, or where some of these ideas uh, are, are communicated. That would not be beneficial. All right, so why does this seem to be the case? I wanna get at some of those, those questions that Dr. Bruce got at, things like social support and, and unpack a little bit why there seems to be this benefit uh, to us. So the number one reason you see in the literature is social support. We are social animals. We do not do well when we're alone. You put a human being in isolation for a long period of time, and that is one of the worst things you can do. We are created to be in relationship, uh, and we thrive in relationships. Even things as simple as hand on the shoulder, has real benefits to most of us. Um, and all the ways we pray, support, take care, interact. Every time I go into West Raleigh and somebody comes up and says, Drew, how's your mom doing? My mom had a stroke a couple of years ago. That's really good for me. Um, those sorts of things really, really do make a difference. And there's a lot of people that are not believers that would say, all of the benefits that you see in these religion and health, that it's all social support. And what is good about a church is it provides social support in ways that other organizations, parts of our community do not. Uh, and, you know, Dr. Bruce and I think others would want to argue that there's probably more going on. It's probably not just social support, but I think it's certainly a part of it. And it comes through in another reason that's given. So, um, Religious individuals follow through on medical treatments much better than non-religious individuals do. That is pretty well known. I think a lot of it is the social support. If I need a ride to go to my doctor's appointment or to go get my prescriptions, or I just had surgery and I come home, where's my next meal come from? That often comes from my church family. Um, I think that social support really can make a difference, particularly for people that are facing some sort of illness in the ways the community gets around and supports them. Um, and so I think that that kind of follow through, it, there's some other reasons that I'll get at that are probably connected to as well, but I think the social support is a big part of it. So I hinted at this earlier, another huge area that could be a set of a series of 15 hour long presentations that I'd want other people to do because I don't know all the research that well is in the study of uh, what we might call as uh, people of faith, like fruits of the spirit, what the researchers call virtues. And almost every virtue has multiple studies that talk about the health benefits of being more generous, being more grateful, being more hopeful, being more joyful, being more loving, being more forgiving being more, you know, having more self-control, having a deeper sense of purpose. The list just goes on and on. Every one of them has a whole host of, of benefits. A lot of them, anxiety and depression is in almost every single one of them. And then a lot of them have an, a, another set of benefits uh, that come with it. Um, and so in as much as our churches are cultivating these virtues, and there is there's some debate over it, but there is some evidence that people that go to church regularly 
are more generous, are more grateful. They're certainly more forgiving, although we're not as forgiving as we should be. <laughs> um, th 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 there, there seem to be real benefits to what we do in the formation that happens in our faith communities that confer some of these health benefits to us as well. Um, this slide is not going to be very helpful because I've got a long list of the 12 benefits of forgiveness in my notes. I do not remember them. I did not commit them to memory. Um, but forgiveness is one of the most studied and the benefits are enormous. Um, I think one of them is conflict resolution. That's going to reduce your anxiety and your stress. Ability to manage anger, I think, is another one um, that, that comes from the, the ability to forgive. Again, all things that reduce that kind of mental burden that long-term has a burden on our physical well-being. Um, forgiveness is another, again, it would be a wonderful full presentation uh, that we could do here with all the, the scientific research that's been done. So another reason um, researchers have suggested is some of the ideas within some of our religious traditions that the body is important. The body is a temple, to use the language of 1 Corinthians, and we are to glorify God with our body. And there's some evidence that suggests, particularly Christians, I think Jews and maybe Muslims as well, we generally follow the rules more than, than others do, than, than non-believers. Um, we smoke less, we drink less, and, you know, random ones that certainly will contribute to a longer life, we're more likely to put on our seatbelt when we get in a car. Um, very simple things, but things that if we take seriously that God values our bodies, we're going to take care of them. We're going to treat them better. Um, and obviously that will in turn have, have better health outcomes. Now I got to get to those caveats though. We love our potlucks and we love our dessert tables. <laughs> And we don't fare as well when it comes to diet and exercise and things of that sort. There, there's actually some studies that show we're less than average healthy on many of those measures around um, exercise and diet. Mm -hmm. um, so that is one area where we do not fare as well. Um, the other one, I, I think I had more than that on this slide, but again, without my notes, I'm, I'm kind of winging this and, and don't remember it. The other big one um, it, again, it's a, it's a whole nother topic we could talk about is there is a huge exception to everything I've said, and that is our clergy. Clergy mental health, clergy burnout. If you paid any attention to denominational or, or church-related publications, you've probably read about how bad the situation is. Um, and the one that, I, that, that came from research that's about two years old that just really held me back uh, for a while. Currently, right now, clergy are showing higher levels of post-traumatic stress disorder than post-deployment military personnel. Whoa. Mm -hmm. Is this post-COVID? This, this was done in the middle of COVID. Mm -hmm. So I think some of that is COVID. It's got all the political right. upheaval, the the the, the racial tensions, like all of these things, figuring out how to do church virtually was a, was a factor. Um, it's another huge area, but clergy are not getting these benefits. Their work is often bringing the benefits to the rest of us, but they're not feeling those benefits themselves. And so that's a big exception. And it's one that I think more and more attention is it being given. I was just on a call with a seminary and talking about, do we want to do some programming together on mental health in the church? And they said, we want to talk about the clergy well-being more so than how to help the clergy help the congregations uh, because they feel that need so acutely. All right. Those of you that know science and tend to favor the physical sciences, you want a biological mechanism. What is physically going on in the bodies? These correlations are nice. They're statistically significant. I think they're useful, but what's really going on? Is it God healing us? Is it medicine? Is there something in our bodies that we can see that is changing that can account for some of this benefit that we see? The real answer is, I don't know. I don't think anybody really knows, but there is some really interesting evidence in telomeres. These are the ends of our chromosomes. And you can take telomeres and you can look at the length and you can tell someone's age biologically. 
And so you can look at somebody that had a really easy life and somebody that had a really hard life and they're the same age and their telomeres are gonna be different lengths. And that's kind of the physical age based on their life experience. Mm -hmm. And there is some evidence, there are some studies that have been done that show religious people tend to at the same age have longer telomeres than their non-religious peers. I may not totally be doing justice to that study, but it, it's a, it's the connection with, forget if it's a religious service participation or what the the level of religiosity, but there, there seems to be a connection there uh, in our telomeres. And so I think there's been some work, but I think it was questioned about white blood cell count, like immune system functioning uh, and some of these things. That there are researchers that are trying to understand, is there something biological going on here? And I think it's fascinating research it could be decades before we really know definitively if we can say it is telomeres, it is immune system or, or what it might be, uh, if we ever discover it. What I wanna end uh, or, or move towards wrapping up on is again, this connection. God can work through all these things. God can, through our faith, through our participation, through God's own grace, give us shorter telomeres. These things are not impossible. God can work through medical science, the immune system, or a faith healer. All of those things I think God can work for to bring about this healing. Um, and so I don't want you to leave this feeling threatened if we never find a biomarker. Well, that means this isn't real. No, God can still work through these things. Um, it's not an either or. Um, we, we don't have to make that, that kind of distinction. All right. As I move towards wrapping up, there's a real healthy um, analogy that I found to summarize all of the research in religion and health. Um, that, and, and I think it, it, it helps me to make sense of a lot of what I just presented to you. Like 80% of the studies are looking at religion, religious service attendance, religious practices like a vaccine mm -hmm. to prevent poor health later on. And only about 20% are looking at religion, prayer, religiosity, service attendance, like a medication. I'm sick, now I take a pill. Um, and so most of the evidence that, that seems to be compelling, religion works more like a vaccine. It has a benefit long-term. It helps us prevent ailments later in life. Um, there's not any good evidence that I know of other than maybe slightly quicker recovery from something like a heart procedure um, where it works like a medicine. And you saw that um, if you went back and looked at that Mayo Clinic quote, the bulk of it, it's only the last line that is thinking of religion, spirituality, like a medicine. All the rest are more like a vaccine. It seems to prevent against these things. And that's not surprising because the, the, the recurring theme is often mental health. It's anxiety, mm -hmm. it's depression, it's stress, mm -hmm. it's suicide, it's lower levels of addiction, which I don't think I mentioned, but is a part of many of the studies. Having lower levels of those things are going to prevent long-term health issues. Um, and so a lot of this work, I think, is very relevant to the mental health crisis that we're in. Um, and I've, I've done this same presentation and I've reframed it and said this whole thing's about mental health mm -hmm. because it, in some ways it really is. Um, and in case you're interested, again, I don't have the data, but I think it's one in five Americans have a diagnosed mental illness. 90% um, of Americans back in mm -hmm. October said we are in the middle of a mental health crisis at levels most of us don't ever remember experiencing. And then the levels of overdose and addiction uh, and a whole host of things are just, the charts are all spiking up since the pandemic. Uh, and so this is a, this is a real crisis uh, that, that, that the church and culture and medicine that we're all trying to address uh, as, as we think about these issues. All right. Have I convinced you that <laughs> science and scripture kind of agree with a few nuances? It's not entirely clear that there's this connection between faith and, and well-being. It's hard to know what to do with that. Um, I don't think any of us attend church. 
because we want to have less risk of heart disease later on. That's not why we attend church. We attend church for, for very, very different reasons. But at the same time, it's also not surprising that, that being the body of Christ, doing the things that God wants us to do are good for us. Um, and so I think it's, it's important to kind of balance those two. To me, the end of the day, it's an encouragement that what we do is worth continuing to do. Um, those little extra things that you might do on a Sunday morning or on a weekday to support your church family, they really are valuable. Keep doing them. Um, that is, I think, a big reason why we see these benefits uh, that, that the researchers are finding. So I hope that can be a, a bit of an encouragement for you. I don't want to make any prosperity gospel kind of suggestions here that if you only believe, you'll get these benefits. I'm, I don't see it that way. I, I see it in, in, in a different light, but um, but one that is still encouraging uh, to us in the church. All right, I will pause there. I can, or I can say more about science for the church, or I can pause there for some discussion. Depends on what the what the group is interested in. So let's open it up for some some questions. I thought it was interesting that the intercess, intercessory prayer wasn't as effective as meditation meditation and con contemplative deep prayer but i do have a group from high school that we stay in touch with i'm from colorado and uh, we're scattered all over the world now but we have this big list serve and whenever anybody gets sick they reach out for more prayers i think they believe deeply that if we're praying for them they're going to get better and they've it's happened a couple of times anyway so yep. mm -hmm. yeah there's the intercessory prayer studies are really hard because to do them properly, you have to do something that none of us want to do. And that is not pray for some people to be healed. <laughs> control. You got to have a control. <laughs> and so how you set up yeah. a control in a prayer study where, where you have kind of can get good data is really complicated. Um, and subjects that are involved, is somebody praying for me or not? I don't know. Is am I being, you know, is this going to be good for like there's all sorts of complicated dynamics in it that make it really difficult to study scientifically. Sure. Um, and so that. I don't I, I wouldn't want to be agnostic rather than say prayer doesn't help us, intercessory prayer. We just we it's not something that that science can really comment significantly on now. Uh, and I tend to be with you. I think God. God does answer our prayers, but God, we also know God doesn't always answer That's those right. intercessory prayers. We wrestle with that dynamic ourselves. Yeah, it, it strikes me. If, if you want your next door neighbor Joe to get better, you know, you pray for him, but you pray for yourself to take him a bowl of soup, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. or to hold his hand or something. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. I, I was thinking about one thing that really supports all you're seeing from kind of a hard nosed, accounting standpoint, the people that run hospitals, you know, pay a chaplain to come in. And I know that's more acute illness than the depression and, you know, scratching mm -hmm. your knee. But uh, it seems that's strong validation. And then we, we had a parish nurse here for a while, Kay Wellama, she's not here. So churches must be recognizing the importance of this too. And, yeah, and, and, I, and the military chaplains. And I think in the last 15 years, there's been more general support in the mm -hmm. medical community for chaplains, mm -hmm. recognizing their value than there would have been two or three decades. Like there was a period of time and then there was a, why are we paying these people? Mm -hmm. Science, you know, medicine is what we need to offer these people to heal them, not this other stuff. And I think people are now starting to see the evidence and starting to value what chaplains can bring. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I think you're exactly right. I would like to say that intercessory prayer doesn't seem to have done much for gun violence. Everyone's <laughs> always sending out thoughts and prayers. Yeah. But... Yeah. yeah. Very true, Don. <laughs> it yep. kind of puts it on us, you know, we, we get to vote. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what I feel, I don't know if this is a question so much as an expression of frustration, if you will, um, seeing the, you know, the, the young people 
younger people, young adults, older teenagers leaving the church, you know, not finding that God is there for them. So then they're going to find that relationship in nature, in, you know, in other places. And yet in so doing, they're, they're leaving much of, of what they've been brought up in, right? But, but they're letting it go. And, and it's disappointing as someone who's, you know, spent a lifetime in that, you know. And as someone who worked in campus ministry, they often, the disconnect comes when they take their first science class in mm-hmm. college, particularly biology. Yeah. <laughs> it's got to yeah. call biology out. It's really interesting. I mean, my, my students at Duke who are physics majors um, or engineers, they seem to be able to stay alongside faith, but boy, biology, and, and it was always over evolution. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Interesting that the social sciences have the highest rates of atheism. Mm-hmm. Uh, and many of them lean on evolutionary theory as part of a basis, but they tend to be even more. And more I guess about. evolution, I don't want you to hear that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's just something that about how it's taught that these that they're not compatible. You know, like you said, I, I thought what was really interesting is when you said, you know, um, about how in other countries there's daily acts of God healing people. I mean, mm-hmm. we forget about that. I, I I think we don't believe it. Right. Right. <laughs> Right. But I think you're absolutely right. I mean, countries I've been into, been gone on trips to, and um, particularly um, poorer countries. Absolutely, I believe it. Haiti and places like that. Well, and I think to piggyback on what you've said, Marina, um, you're right. They're leaving or they're pushing it aside. And part of the reason I have heard or I see is because they're waiting for it to come to lift them. And they're not as involved. They may have been raised in the church, but the responsibility to the church by being in the church, they're not participating in that part of it. And so I think there's a a part of our education for our young people to um, let them know it's it's not just a social club. There are responsibilities. And we talk about stewardship and such, but there are uh, responsibilities of your heart and of your deeds and of your prayers or whatever it is. And, and I think that tends to get missing. And so they haven't bought into it. So their connection isn't as strong. Yeah. I mean, just overall, our levels of trust, our levels mm-hmm. of belonging to, to anything have just, mm-hmm. they've reduced significantly. Yeah. They right. can't see um, it. It doesn't exist. Right. Um, but I mean, Every measure of trust in every institution in American society, the, the the trust has gone down at some point in the last several decades. And so young people don't trust. And, and there's good reasons. I mean, there's enough churches that have done enough damage. It's not surprising that they don't totally trust. I think in, in my mind, one of the challenges is I'm a sinner. I can be hypocritical. I can say one thing and do the other. I'm flawed, but yet I'm still part of this community and I'm going to accept you flawed and I hope you're going to accept me flawed. That's where I sometimes feel there's not that appreciation. Like if you don't live up to the ideal of Jesus, right, right. then you're hypocritical and I don't want to be, a, well, none of us do. Right. None of us can. Um, and, and how we kind of have that level-headed expectation of one another in all spheres of life, but particularly the church, I think is a real challenge. And I think some of it is, um, I think this is less so probably in the main line, but the way we've, let's let the youth leader take care of the kids. Let's put them over here and, and, and not let them see and, and appreciate the intergenerational where we navigate. Well, yeah, Joe's got a little bit of anger problem, but we love Joe nonetheless. Mm-hmm. They, they need to see that, not just Joe's anger problem. Um, and I think it's a lot about forgiveness, as you've mm-hmm. said, and it's about the, the young person to forgive themselves. Mm-hmm. And then the, that reaches out to others. But it is very hard when you see the standard that is set by a, maybe a real pious church goer or a pious Sunday school teacher or something. Well, I can't do that, so why bother? And, and so it's an either or. And it's not be based on the forgiveness of, 
I can't, I will never be able to do it. And that's just okay. Mm -hmm. And I, and I think we, we tend to forget that component. Yeah. I wonder how much too, we, we are really teaching, particularly, I mean, when I think about us here, it's been really hard, contemplative and centering prayer practices. It's really hard. I mean, we talked a lot in staff about um, just having people come into the sanctuary while the, while the, while the work is playing and be quiet and meditate and listen for the music. And, and this, this church, they come in and it's just oh, like, really it's like social hour. <laughs> They're, they, tra they're training social support for contemplative. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, which I just feel like they you know, it's just, it's hard getting that balance in there. Not, not that the social stuff's not, it is important, but um, yeah, just having some quiet time where you can. And you I know, think we need training. Mm -hmm. it's, I mean, the younger yeah. generation, or I'll talk about my children who are adults, but they, they meditate and they do it well and they mm -hmm. do it religiously. And I mean, Megan shuts herself in a closet because California is such small places. <laughs> and you know, it's like, where's Megan? Where's Megan? She's in the closet. <laughs> and and it goes without fail. And it she does emerge different. Mm -hmm. you know? She does emerge better than when she went in. Let's put it mm -hmm. that way. And and I I wonder if we couldn't have meditation training or how to do it or what what's what does it mean? I think we think it's a step one, two, three, mm -hmm. when it can be so much more global yeah, and teach us how to be quiet. Yeah, we, we did have an aperture with Jeff Vaughn. Yes. Teaches and meditation. Exactly. He's part of the camp, family support cancer unit. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But I, I feel like doctors are moving more towards recognizing what you're talking about. And we talk more about patient-centered medicine. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I was waiting to get my booster shot today, and I was looking at some medical commercial uh, and it, it talked about three kinds of support and one of them was spirituality this was from a drug firm i mm -hmm. think dealing with cancer mm -hmm. dealing with depression and cancer patients and spirituality mm -hmm. was one of the elements of that yeah wow i think there's definitely an increasing levels and um you know knowing some chaplains the I feel like they're they're not go deal with the patient at a quiet time when we're not doing medicine. They're we're engaging with the patient and the family right now, and we need you by our side, supporting us as the medical community. So I feel like there's there's more partnership there, which I think is another line of evidence for for exactly that there's more acceptance of this because I mean modern Western medicine is based on data. And if the data is showing connections that are positive, we would hope they would take them seriously. Right. Hospice has almost always has a chaplain that comes along as part of it. Right. It's also been a problem though. Sometimes they, they come with their chaplain. They don't ask them who their home past. I mean, I've, ha I've been shut mm -hmm. out from that mm -hmm. process too, mm -hmm. um, as much as um, included in. Mm -hmm. um, I guess they know the quality of I, I don't know what. Um, maybe they know the quality of their chaplain that they come along that comes up but they don't know the quality of who they're going to get right. as a person's mm -hmm. past some of it could be comfort level too yeah okay. susan you're talking about meditation um the church i belonged to um and i apologize if i'm offending anyone when donald trump was elected president um the week after it started opening its sanctuary from 5 to 7 30 on tuesday evenings for people to pray and mm -hmm. meditate. Wow. Yeah. And not a lot of people took advantage of it. I did for a year and it certainly helped me through that first year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was gonna say we do off we've offered that many times. It's not often, it's not really taken no, all that much. Love that. It, it's it's I love it. yeah, you and I we did it. remember we did a season where we met every Thursday and especially you and me and Jerry. <laughs> Okay, so it, it does get offered, but it doesn't get to yeah. that long. And I, think, and I think part of it is because what do you do? You know, for a person who's not a meditative, are you going to pray the whole time? Can you just sit and listen to quiet? Those are sort of helpful training tips sure. yeah. that yeah. let you know, can you repeat a phrase? I mean, we, we all see the person cross-legged sitting yeah. down, crisscross applesauce. Well, I'd still be there all week long because I couldn't get up. <laughs> but nonetheless, you know, if I sort of had a, a ritual yeah. like I know I will have in church, 
I know what comes first and second and third. It's yeah. very supportive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We yeah. healing and wholeness services. I think you, if you, you encounter some of those things, I think you will begin to learn. When you come, you'll begin to learn some things. Yeah, um, it's not all at once. It takes practice. It's an art. Like and, and there may also be creative ways. Um, you know, another thing that's really good for us is to be out in nature. Mm -hmm. Being in this room is not mm -hmm. that good for us with artificial light and, and everything. But being out in nature, really, so walk and meditate as a group. Yeah. Have I that be an, an event. Meet the people that don't want to come into a sanctuary, but they want to be outside on a Sunday. So we had a lab. You yeah, do it with your dog. I do yeah. it with my dog. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I know I'm meditating and yeah. engaging with nature. So mm -hmm. it's not, I mean, I'm not saying I understand what meditation is, but I, my mind is going places where it doesn't usually go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. My dog sits in the road when he gets tired. <laughs> Carry him on. <laughs> He's meditating. Yeah. And you're exercising. <laughs> Are there other questions from, the, from around the table? Someone who hasn't asked a question yet that has something on their heart? Do you want to tell us a little bit about your work? Ed? Sure. Sure. See if I can get this to share my screen one more time. I may not uh, go full way. I'll just share this with you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Interesting. So just a little bit about Science for the Church. Um, so we grow out of a series of programs that I was involved with when I was at Templeton. And then in the years afterwards that we were trying to get more churches, more clergy to engage science and to engage it in a better way. Um, and we found again and again with the churches that we were able to fund and, and you know, actually intentionally did things by a whole host of measures that benefited the church. New people showed up, um, scientists grew spiritually, everybody learned science, pastors say they grew spiritually, lay people say they grew spiritually from being a part of these programs. Um, churches got a reputation in their community, they became known for this. Churches said, oh, well, we tackled science. That election was pretty tough. I bet we can talk about political division too, because we can talk mm -hmm. about science and faith. <laughs> so they were they learned skills that they could apply to other difficult topics. Uh, and so that kind of led to we want to formalize this. We want to try to advance this and not just run another program with a new name and a new acronym, but create a ministry that that supports that. Um and we have, let me see if I can, there we go. So we have taken some of those lessons that'll change in just a sec there for <laughs> those of you online. Um, we have created what we call the standard model. We, we love science, so we had to play on particle physics with this one, but it is essentially the lessons we learned from those programs that conferred those benefits, a real short six-step guide, how do you do that? Um, and really it's, it's about one step. It's about science professionals and church leaders intentionally working together and figuring out what makes sense in their community, mm -hmm. because every community is different. Every community is going to be wanting to engage different areas of science, uh, a farming community versus a medical research area, different topics, different expertise, different interests, but you can do that together. You can we're trying to ramp up our, our campus ministry. Well, that's going to be a different thing than a ministry to older adults. Um, we have a vibrant you know, um, worship time, and we really want to think about integrating science there. Well, that's another church may want to do it in the Sunday school hour. Mm -hmm. um, all of those things you can do contextually, but you got to have these relationships because most clergy are not going to raise their hand and say, let me tell you about biochemistry. I remember my, bi no, they, that's not what their focus is. And most biochemists aren't going to say, well, let me tell you about my Bible classes in undergrad. Um, they, they don't have that expertise. So let them learn from one another uh, and share. Um, so we also are the main thing, the main activity we provide for the church right now is our weekly newsletter. Um, it was going to come up there in a sec. Sorry about the delay. Uh, every Tuesday, we deal with a, a practical topic. We deal with a, a scientific theme. Um, we just published this week a devotional. 
um, that, that uses science to kind of inform scripture. Uh, I wrote that one on memory um, and linking that to scripture. A whole host of topics to try to help the church imagine what this might look like. We interview scientists, we interview pastors, we profile churches. We're kind of all over the place. Uh, if you're looking for one united theme, we're not your your you know we're not going to work very well for you because we're we're trying to help the church appreciate the breadth of ways. I think Marita has some sign up sheets that she can pass around. For those of you that are technologically savvy, you can do the QR code there. Uh, but uh, you know, would love it if you wanted to sign up, and uh, you you can also go on our website, scienceforthechurch.org, and just sign up online as well. We are starting to now offer products. Um, so the first one we released was a devotional that was written by a biologist. Uh, and she takes several stories and aspects of the life of Christ and puts them in conversation, particularly with the biological sciences. Um, so her favorite miracle of Jesus is him walking on water. And she puts that in conversation with the basilisk lizard, which can run across water. Yeah. Uh, and there's there's tidbits. I think we would have to run the average people would have to run is it 75 miles an hour to be able to to, to run across water like the basilisk lizard. So it's things like that that she puts in conversation with scripture. Um, and we've got a we're putting together one for Advent um, based on some devotionals we've done in our newsletter next year, and we're starting to develop some curriculum. Um, unfortunately, our web designer is dealing with major family crisis, right? I'm not our web designer, our graphic designer. And so our curriculum is delayed until we don't know when, uh, mm -hmm. but, but hopefully we'll be offering that soon. So things okay. you might be able to use in, in Sunday school. I've gone um, through it already once, so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so there's our URL. We're on social media. Feel free to write down my email address if you've got, I'm looking for resources on this topic or, um, do you know of churches that are engaging in this? There, there's quite a bit of activity in this region. Mm -hmm. West Raleigh has a lot of NC State scientists. We've worked very closely with Holy Trinity Lutheran uh, in Chapel Hill. They've got some incredible things they've been doing. Um, and so we're, we're happy to assist what Westminster is interested in doing um, here in the area, partnering with other churches, doing it on your own. The Jill and Halls will be great. They, yep. mm -hmm. they will be too. <laughs> in, in, engaging uh, in this work. So. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Well, look, Drew, thank you so much for this excellent presentation and uh, yeah, helping us to think a little bit about um, how, how God uses the church for healing. And um, so why don't we close with prayer? Gracious God, we thank you for creating each of us fearfully and wonderfully. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of healing, for the gift of church and of faith. We thank you for the gift of community. Thank you for using all of these to bring about healing and wholeness and blessing. We pray that as we go from this place, that you will keep us in your care, that you will continue to shine within us and shine from us, that others may see your light all around. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Drew. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, friends, for being online with us. And uh, appreciate your coming. <laughs> okay, thank you. Good night. Bye. Good night. Bye. Good night. Bye. Bye. I wonder just sit next to you. <laughs> <laughs>